Batting helmets are pretty versatile. They're the perfect projectile, either thrown or batted. They're the perfect way to hide communication devices, or so you'd think, and we can all agree they make the absolute best nacho bowl on the planet. You, you don't eat the bowl, man. Today we're going to look at the timeline of events that led us to the modern batting helmet technology we have today, as well as notable baseball players who helped move the needle toward better player safety. As with any origin story pertaining to our national pastime, it's a whole lot more interesting than you'd think. Shout out to Tyler who suggested I cover this subject several months back on Twitter. Glad I finally got around to it. The patent for the first batting helmet, then known as the head protector, was obtained by an inventor named Frank Moggridge all the way back in 1905, a time when the Braves were still the bean eaters and the White Sox were the... Damn, they were already the White Sox. Moggridge's design looked like an inflatable boxing glove that wrapped around the back of the head and covered the ears. It was a far cry from the helmet of today. Two years later, Hall of Fame catcher Roger Bresnahan, who was in his prime as the New York Giants backstop, started experimenting with batting helmets in addition to the first protective gear for catchers. In June of 1907, Bresnahan was hit in the head by Reds pitcher Andy Coakley and was in such bad condition that a Catholic priest came out onto the field to read him his last rites. Bresnahan started drawing up helmet schematics while still hospitalized for that incident. Bresnahan would not see the fruits of his labor in the form of helmets gaining popularity in his lifetime. Moving on to a more well-known piece of the puzzle, in 1920, Cleveland Indians shortstop Ray Chapman was hit in the head by a thrown pitch by Yankees submariner Carl Mays. The sound of the ball cracking Chapman's skull was so loud, Mays thought it had hit the bat, so he fielded the ball and threw to first. Ray Chapman became the only Major League Baseball player to ever die on the field. Nearly a close second was his teammate Ray Caldwell, who was struck by lightning on the mound and pitched a perfect game just 14 days later. Cleveland was on the forefront of not only advancements in headgear, but also the black memorial armbands you see in sports, and the idea that weather delays may be in order. In 1936, Willie Wells, a Negro League player from the Newark Eagles, was struck in the temple and knocked unconscious. He wore a coal miner's hard hat the next day. He did remove the light on the front. As you'd imagine, based on the pay situation in the Negro Leagues, several of his teammates were off-season coal miners in Pennsylvania and West Virginia, so there were plenty of those on hand. Congrats, Hat Billy, you almost made it to the three-minute mark without making it about Appalachia. The Great Red The next year, 1937, Mickey Cochran, a Hall of Fame catcher for the Tigers, suffered a skull fracture and nearly died. He was forced to retire from baseball in the aftermath from the injury. After news of this incident circulated throughout the league, the Philadelphia A's and the Cleveland Indians began wearing polo helmets in practice as a test run. Indians manager Steve O'Neill was on the field the day Ray Chapman died, so naturally he knew the importance of the helmet but ultimately the players declined to wear them in a game. The Des Moines Demons were credited as the first baseball team to wear helmets in a game in the late 30s, but only for one game. I believe it was a superstitious situation where they got blown out while wearing them, so they buried them out past the left field fence and never wore them again. A trendsetter of sorts, the Demons are also credited as the first baseball team to host a night game. In 1941, the National League developed a helmet designed by a Johns Hopkins brain surgeon named George Bennett, but it went largely unused save for a couple of teams. The Brooklyn Dodgers would become the first major league team to wear helmets, and the Washington Senators would follow suit shortly after. Branch Rickey, who was at the helm of the Dodgers mandate, moved on to the Pittsburgh Pirates. They too carried a strict helmet mandate into the 50s. Little League Baseball mandated helmets in the early 50s and introduced their own design which looked like this. The National League followed Little League's lead, mandating batter's helmets in 1956. The American League put a similar rule in place in 58. Jim Lemon of the Senators was the first player to wear the Little League helmet in the big leagues. Veteran players were grandfathered into an exemption of the mandate. This was also true in the NHL, which was very much evolving at the same rate in terms of gaining popularity while also trying to take precautions to make the game safer. If you haven't looked at some of these satisfying yet kind of horrifying prototype goalie masks, it's definitely worth your time. 
Moving on to 1967 and the story of Tony Canigliero. Tony was a phenom who made it to the majors at age 19. He was a dead pull hitter who reached 100 career home runs before any player in history. Fenway helped, but to be fair, he hit him everywhere he went. Canigliero was struck by a Jack Hamilton pitch on the left cheekbone and had cornea damage beyond repair. Here's his infamous Sports Illustrated cover. Though he would finally return a year and a half later, he was never the same hitter he was before his injury. An alteration was made to Fenway Park for a section called Canigliero's Corner to prevent interference in the batter's eye, having a darker color behind the pitcher's release point, allowing the hitter to pick up the ball in the contrast. Ironically, a Red Sox player was also the last in history to bat without a helmet. That was Bob Montgomery in 1979. Tony Gonzalez of the Phillies was at the top of the National League in the hit-by-pitch category for a whole decade. He was the first to wear a helmet with the pre-molded ear flap, or C-flap, that we see today. Hall of Fame Orioles third baseman Brooks Robinson had an interesting alteration as well. He sawed off most of the brim of his helmet to improve his vision. This would become something of a trademark of his. This wasn't the only notable helmet alteration to come out of Baltimore Memorial Stadium. In 1979, Gary Reneke, whose jaw was broken, would wear a helmet with a partial face mask which was taken off of the football helmet of Colts legendary quarterback, Bart Jones. This was most likely the inspiration for the face masks we see softball players use today. Ironically, Reneke's counterparts in the 1979 World Series, the Pirates, had their own face mask guy. Look at the already imposing Dave Parker playing in a goalie mask the year prior following a broken jaw from a home plate collision. In 1983, it was mandated that players come up to bat in a helmet with at least one ear flap. Notable beanings from the 80s included this scary shot to Dickie Thon's face and Goose Gossage blowing Ron Say's helmet clear off his head. In the modern era, injuries still happen, but helmet technology is pretty sophisticated. We're actively studying concussions in all sports and taking better precautions to prevent them. Missed time for broken facial bones is at an all-time low, but accidents still happen. In 2007, Mike Coolball was killed by a line drive while coaching first base for the AA Tulsa Drillers, who were a Rockies affiliate at that time. The coroner ruled that he was actually hit in the neck which ruptured an artery, but national news had already run with a ball to the head as the cause of death. Regardless, we're now pushing for headgear for coaches too. Everyone deserves a safe, happy day at the ballpark. Take it easy.